Well, first, I just want to say thank you to the Globe Gazette, Howard, Tom, Bob, Jane. I appreciate it. Uh, as you know, I've been here before, and uh, I know how tough you guys can be. I appreciate you giving us such opportunity, especially this election season, when I'm not sure what's happening with the, the debate situation. Uh, my name's Max Weaver. I'm 60, I'll be 62 years old in January, and uh, I'm uh, running for the uh, position of mayor in Mason City. I'm very serious about it, and uh, uh, I think I'm going to do a very good job, and uh, I'm ready for it. I served three terms on the city council, and um, I think uh, what I learned uh, that in the two years I took off, being very responsible and uh, respective to the community, I've learned even more. Um, it really comes down to a, a simple little issue, I believe. Uh, Mayor Bookmeyer, uh, we, he, his campaign four years ago, he ran on the three Ds, uh, diligence, decorum, and discipline. My three Ds for my campaign are democracy, diversity, and dedication. You could look at those and just pretty much make up your mind and ask yourself, what three of those Ds would you rather live with? And uh, that plus, I've recognized over two years, the last two years specifically, the strong division in the community. There's a division in the community that 10 to 15 percent of the people I think are being pretty fairly and, and uh, representative by their elected officials, Mayor Bookmeyer. And I think there's a wide swath, the other 85 percent, that are not being representative. So, representative. I can bring, I'm the one candidate that can bring everyone together. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be the mayor that includes everybody, that 10 and 15 percent and that 85 percent. I'm looking forward to doing that, and I'm ready to uh, lead and be your mayor. Many people are talking about the direction the city is going. What do you think the city is going in? What about the direction it's heading right now? Well, Jane, thank you. You know, that's a, I appreciate that question. I feel like my 12 years and my commitment to the city, my passion, um, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm invested emotionally and politically in the community. My family's from here, I'm from here. I feel like some of my politics and some of the good work that I've done has been hijacked. And what I mean is, is uh, they're telling everyone that, and, and somewhat the globe is included in this too, that I'm anti-establishment that I'm uh, the boogeyman, that I'm not right for the job, that I'm, I'm not the person for it. I, I just want to remind everyone and everyone here and uh, citizens, I'm for everything. I just like good debate and I like to uh, get the best deal that I can for the citizens. I've done that not just in uh, front of the table, but I've done it in back of the table for almost 30 years. Here's two specific things I'd like to say to you about that direction. If you if you are correct, Jane, about the, the direction, your, your question is a legitimate one, then I have a lot to do with that. If you remember, and your record will prove and show, and I wish you would maybe write about it a little more. It was my vote, four to two. I was the swing vote that got the Main Street built. Four to two vote. Your paper wrote in there a comment from another elected official that I was a hero for bringing Plan B back. I worked hard with Michael Gartner and Andy Anderson of the Vision Iowa and got the city off the hook for 20 years of financial responsibility for the Park Inn. You have to remember my first responsibility as a uh, elected official is the fiduciary responsibility of a community. And if you like the direction your community's going and you're downtown, well, you know what, I'll wear that badge of, uh, that says I'm a hero. It was my two votes. It was my plan B, and I'm proud of that. And I think it really clarifies the issue of whether or not I'm anti-business. I uh, knew my, what my responsibility was to everyone. And I think I fulfilled that responsibility reasonably and appropriately. And uh, 
I wish you would, uh, I wish your newspaper, you know what, you could remind the people of that too. What's the role of city of the city and, and city government in particular in in providing or creating good jobs for the citizens? And how do you think we're doing in that regard? Well, Bob, that's a that's a tough question because the role has really never been defined about what elected officials, what a community can do to create jobs. It's a tough game. It's a tough sport. It's a contact sport, and um, I think Mason City's doing as good a job as any other community in the state of Iowa. I mean, we're limited by certain things and the, what the legislator gives us to work with, what they and how they fund the economic development uh, IDED down in Des Moines. And uh, I think we're playing at a, a, a pretty, pretty good level over the years that I've seen. I, you know, I'm aware of, uh, I'm probably the only candidate that knows about the Mason City Development Association formed in 1960, the stocks that they sold the transition they made in 1987 as the uh, Mesa City EDC and another transition to the North Iowa Corridor and the merger with regionalization. I supported all those. I supported all those. As an elected official, I'm not sure I uh, was against anything when it came to economic development except for questioning the funds and uh, what we were getting for them. Again, when you take the oath of office as an elected official, I take it seriously that that's part of our duties. Now, with that said, I, if elected mayor, promise to uh, work within the structure that's already in place. It would be uh, one of my, it would be my first focus in the community to sit down with Brent Willett of the North Iowa Corridor, uh, Robin Anderson from the Chamber of Commerce, uh, representatives from Clear Lake, our partners in the county, and uh, work with them. I don't, I'm not going to, uh, you got to remember, this is the good news. I'm running for mayor, not city council. The mayor doesn't budget anything. The city council has to call on all that, and I'll support what the city council mm -hmm. does. And most of all, I think what's important for you guys to hear, I know what's important for you guys to hear, and I believe this, is that we all lay our swords down. You can't be on the city council in the front of the room for three terms and in the back of the room and not have some controversy. If you don't, I'm not sure you've done the elected official uh, position right. But I'd be, uh, that would be my first move as, uh, as mayor, would be to meet with that structure that's in place and work with them and uh, try to understand what their needs are and uh, I would help facilitate that. That would be the first thing I would do if I was elected mayor. Speaking of the EDC, the city contributes more than $100,000 a year to the corridor. Is that a good investment? And well, how should the partnership be with the Chamber of Commerce? Um, like I said, I think I just mentioned to you that the structure's in place. <clears throat> the budgeting of the uh, corridor is uh, exclusively up to the city council. It's their call and I would support whatever they decided. Um, I, uh, I support the structure that's in place. I would work with it, not against it. And um, I look forward to the new role of uh, being mayor if elected. I'm pretty excited about it. I, I think it's a great opportunity for me to uh, show how serious I am about the community we all live in. So you have no opinion on the hundred thousand dollars? No, I think that's a that's like I said before. This is the good news for me. I'm running for mayor. The council makes up that budget. They bring it forward. They vote on it. I'll facilitate whatever they need. I'll meet with uh, our partners in, in the uh, corridor and discuss what they feel is their needs. I'm sure, just as Mayor Nelson Crab, if he gets reelected, will do, and uh, the supervisors. So. I, I know full well what the role is, and I'm not looking at uh, uh, upsetting uh, what's in place at all. That's not, that's not my goal at all and my intentions. I, uh, I'm actually looking forward to work with... Uh, and you know, the good thing is with me, is that after all those years in front and the back of the room, I've, uh, I know all the personalities, just as they know mine. So we all kind of know what to expect and stuff, and I think we're going to be... I can tell you right now, I can just feel it, that we're all going to be on our best behavior for 
that one goal in the, in the, in the issue of jobs is that create is and build the tax base and create jobs as, as much as we can do it together as a regional uh, partnership. I support that. I think I supported that as a council member when we we went there. That leads into the next question about the role of the mayor. What's the role of the mayor and the council and the city administrator? How do how would you say that structure should work? Well, you know, I'm glad you asked that question because it's not working. Um, people are confused as I talk to people about what government, who is the leader? Employees of the city, I've met, as you know, I've had five public town hall meetings and I'm going to have seven or eight more. And um, we've got employees, I've had, uh, and it's on the record, it's, uh, it's on the film it's somewhere, and uh, I've had on two different instances a 40-year employee from the city say that it's the worst they've ever seen it, that the uh, morale is the worst. They've been told who to talk to, who not to talk to. It's been handed down to them. They've never seen anything like it. I had another employee with uh, over 35 years. Uh, we met uh, with uh, one of the unions in the community. He stood up and was adamant about the division in the community that he feels. And his family is very invested in the community. And he said there's a division. There's a division in place. And, and that's part of my campaign is there is a division. And it's not good for the community. And uh, I'm the one candidate who can bring everyone together. Um, what was the second part of your question, Jane? On the city administrator sure. and the council Thank you. and how everything. Well, as you know, I think you probably do know, uh, in 1993, there was some discussion at the city council when I was in the back of the room. I was very active. A couple council members asked me, uh, and we, we talked, they visited. It was a very open government back then. We had a lot of discussion, and they included people in the, in the citizenry in the back. I, uh, along with two other people, furnished a petition that changed our form of government in, I believe, 1994. I was very involved. Uh, what we did then was change our form of government to uh, what was then a strong mayor form of government. He was the CEO, he or she would be the CEO, and have all the powers and duties vested to them from financial to head of a department's hire, fire. And we changed that form of government in 1994 to a weak mayor form of government, uh, city administrator. And uh, it took till about 1999, five years for the citizens to understand who do they talk to, who, who's in charge. What it, it took us that long just to get them acclimated to what we had, had did. As you know, any given night, any council meeting night that they have a meeting and it's on the agenda, they can change back to that strong mayor form of government with just a vote, a, a positive vote of the six council members. We wrote that in there too. And when I say we, it was the elected officials and the citizens. We all had it involved in it. I, that's what I miss most about the government. Today, nobody knows who the boss is. Is it Mayor Eric Bookmeyer or is it Brent Trout? Now, if you get the city code and, and Brent Trout's job description, you'll see the big difference there, but you won't recognize it. That's what's got the employees frustrated. That's what has the employees, the morale at the... Uh, with the three unions and the non-bargaining uh, members. You know, we have 250, 275 employees with a $13 million budget, salary budget, and uh, over a million of that comes out of City Hall, and they're all wondering. They're, this campaign has showed me how they are all walking on glass, and that's just not right. So we don't know what's... But I can tell you this, if elected... I will assume the role as it is written by the law, the city ordinance, of a weak mayor. I'm actually looking forward to it. Now, if you want to continue to have the confusion and to have that uh, mayor do what he's doing, uh, is, he the, is he over Brent? No, he's not. Brent answers to the city council. Uh, if you want to continue with that, my suggestion would simply be that... Uh, they change it. They go back to a strong mayor form of government and have a new election. They want to change that. Uh, but it's confusing. It's not appropriate. I don't know if it's illegal. I think city ordinances are the law. They're violating that. 
I think all you need to do is read the four paragraph description of the mayor's job, which used to be several paragraphs in the state code, and uh, read Brett Trout's job description, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's it's quite confusing to the, especially to the employees, and it's quite confusing to me. And it's also one of the reasons I'm running, is among others, is to bring back the weak mayor form of government that we truly have. One of the more controversial decisions that the, the council made in the last year um, was uh, essentially defunding the Human Rights Commission, cutting their budget from $143,000 to $15,000. Um, what's your reaction to that decision, and, and would you change anything under your term? Thanks, Bob. You know what? <clears throat> I did take two years off. I uh, was very respectful to the citizens of Mason City. I've been involved in a long time. <clears throat> and I thought, uh, you know, with the defeat two years ago with a small 26% of the voters showing up, that uh, I just needed to step back and reevaluate who I was and where am I at politically, where am I at with that investment in the community. And I saw some great things, and I saw some good things in me that uh, it made me uh, look at things a little differently. This is the one time, uh, actually the uh, human rights issue started in the uh, fall of 2009. I received several phone calls from a very inexperienced Eric Bookmeyer, who was not elected yet, but felt that he was going to be elected, and uh, Travis Hickey. Uh, now, Councilman Hickey and uh, now Mary Bookmeyer called me several times, and we talked about different things. And one of the suggestions they had to me and brought up to me was, how do we deal with human rights, and how do we get rid of it? I, uh, I listened very carefully. I didn't like the strategy. I didn't like what they were talking about and how they were talking about it. I felt all this conversation should have taken place uh, in the open. Now, this is where the inexperience, being too young, too inexperienced, comes in. Don Nelson, Councilman Nelson, Marsters, and Weaver, we fought off that type of what was considered then a takeover by many in the city hall and the community. We fought it off for the two years that we had left, and then as you saw, you saw what happened, Bob. It was just really not necessary. True leadership. And as you remember, Mayor Bookmeyer's one of his early comments, I believe, in January or February of 2010 was he wanted younger people involved and uh, not older people. Well, no, you know, you don't ever want to do that. You know, we all get, and me included, uh, you develop a certain amount of wisdom as you get older, as you age, and I respect that. And they could have used some wisdom back then uh, we did what we could to try to steer the conversation into uh, more of a practical, uh, safe venue to avoid litigation. Or, and not always. You can't always avoid litigation in government. That's just part of life, and they have protection, the council members. But it's truly clear where the inexperience that led to the demise of the, the budget. Um, this is the one time where I would have liked to have been involved. I wasn't on the council with my experience of many years and working with Lionel Foster, you know. How do you, it's a 40 plus year employee public service and the job that he did. This is what I would have done, Bob. This is what, real simple. I would have directed as a council member, Brent Trout to sit down with Mr. Foster and ask him a few questions. Lionel, do we have an exit strategy for your retirement? You know, not many people work till they're 75 in a position like that. I respect that, and that's legal. But I certainly would have just sent our man, our city administrator, we're his bosses, to ask Lionel, what's the exit strategy you might have, and where do you see the human rights going after your retirement? What do you want? What do you see? What is the benefit? Nobody did that. Nobody did that. Councilman members Marsters, Nelson, and Weaver, myself, we had many discussions with Lionel over the last two years on the council. 
He was very open. He would talk to anybody. I don't know what happened, how the sneaking around went, the backdoor uh, politics. It was unfortunate. But I chalk it up. I'm not saying it was critical or bad. I chalk it up to inexperience. And as mayor, I'll bring a load, a ton of experience, good stuff about uh, our political uh, past and our political future and where we want to go in the direction. It, it was a, it was a, it was a mistake. I'm sure that some of those, you know, it was a new council. The mayor was relatively new, a young guy, given all that power. Not sure if it was a weak mayor, or strong mayor. He, I think, he could have been a little uh, of abuse of his power. And then you had what two? Two, three pretty relatively new council members. He's just inexperience. Now look where we're at. We have a uh, civil rights file uh, 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 application down there, whether we did anything wrong or not. There's probably going to be some sort of litigation filed here in the next two or three months. And um, I would say uh, it could have been handled differently. And that responsibility uh, is a lot. But that's where experience counts, and I have the experience. Uh, I will bring that to the table. I want to say this, too. There's a very good chance I could have supported it if it was done above board as a council member. I'm not saying it was a wrong decision. I am saying to you that it was not done properly is disrespectful, not only to Mr. Foster, but the community. It might have been a good decision when you look at everything in the big picture, but I certainly would have included Lionel Foster in that. Now, I think your follow-up question should certainly be, would I be an advocate to restore everything back to where it was? That's not how I govern. I have proof. Uh, you can see what I've done in 12 years. Councils have a tendency to encumber other councils. Uh, you saw it back in the Indian Head where the rules were changed to accommodate what some council members felt was right for the community. I don't play like that. I respect what the previous council members have done and governed. And uh, I think Alex Kuhn said it best, Councilman Kuhn. He said, things will be okay. We're going to work with Des Moines. We're going to have great representation. My comment on that is, all right, time will tell. Let's give it some time and just see how it works out for our citizens. Question number seven. Max, if you're elected, what will be your top two or three priorities for the next four years? Uh, helping facilitate uh, the city council members, Brent Trout and the citizens to understand what we're doing, bring everybody in, close the division in the community, uh, let people... Here's what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. You know what? I've been involved since the late 70s. It's real simple. As a mayor, weak form mayor of government that we have, I've taken, uh, I've worked with seven mayors, Tom. I handed my first petition in in 1978 so you could vote on Southbridge Mall. I'm going to take a piece. Let's start with Mayor Roger Bang. I'm going to take a piece of his, what I saw Roger do. Now, I had conflict with all these mayors, but we also had some good things, too. I like discourse. I like conversation. I like questioning. I like an involved constituency, and I was that. But what I learned from Roger Bang, Roger was a, I tell you, he did it better than anybody. I never heard that man ever say anything negative about anyone. Nobody. He extended his hand to everyone. He welcomed everyone to the council meetings. He welcomed everyone to City Hall. He was very genuine and gracious. I'm going to steal that from Roger. I've already stole that from him. Mayor Romans. Do I need to tell you? The average attendance when I was on the city council, it was around 35 to 40 people a meeting, citizens, not staff, citizens. Today, you're averaging two to three citizens in that room. I'm going to take a piece of Dr. Romans, Mayor Romans, 
uh, philosophy, the way he governed. <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember it, but some of the council meetings went to 10, 11 o'clock at night. And you know why? He let everyone speak. He let everyone talk. He brought coffee and cookies to the council meeting and welcomed the community. I'm going to do the same thing, and we're going to fill that room back up. We're going to give this back to the citizens, their council meetings, their city hall. Third mayor, thirdly, Mayor Ken Q. <laughs> Southbridge. Mayor Ken Q was uh, very good at what he did. He could be just as rough as I, I guess, in some of our conversations. But he did this thing better than anybody. If there was a concern by the employees or a citizen, Mayor Q saw to it that you got an answer, that you were turned into the right direction for help, that you've got, uh, 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 we were able to access um, the help that you needed. And I'm going to bring that. And I think that's going to make me the best darn mayor Mason City's ever had, and I'm looking forward to that. It's pretty simple. Now, I'm not running for a strong mayor. I'm not running to be the king. I'm not running to be everyone's boss. I'm running to be the best darn mayor Mason City's ever had. And quite frankly, I'm the only candidate, and I'm the only mayor that Mason City's had that, in my knowledge, and it goes back to Mayor Menden in the 60s, and then Jolas. I, uh, and forward, I think I have the ability, more than any of those personalities and mayors, to bring everyone inclusive. I, uh, all the tribes, the 28, 30 neighborhoods, I can bring them together and make them feel as uh, there's something in it for all of us. Actually, I'll, uh, I think the philosophy uh, from those three mayors and will make me uh, able to do that. And don't forget, Howard, publisher of the Globe Gazette, you and I have bumped heads before. I don't think we hold any grudges to each other. We've been friendly to each other. We've had our own <coughs> issues. I've come in here. You've listened to me. You've been gracious enough to give me your time. It's valuable. I am a communicator. I don't have a real uh, hard time talking to people. Actually, I'm a pretty likable guy. i uh, looking forward to being uh, the person in the center of that platform. I'm looking forward to being uh, the mayor of Mesa City, my hometown. Max, usually the kicker question. You're only like Howard, did you say kicker question? Kicker question. Okay, I like that. I can't think of anything else to call it. Kind of a kicker question because it's not on the list. It wasn't anything that was decided to come, but it was something I'm always curious about, and I think you've already answered the question repeatedly. And the question usually goes something like this. If you walk up to a stranger, knock on their door, and you only have 30 seconds to convince them to vote for you, what would you say? Well, that is a, that's not a kicker question. That's a trick question, and that's a really good question, to tell you the truth. To, to be honest with you, there's only one or two other uh, elected officials and not elected officials that have walked the community as much as we have. I've walked Mason City three times, 10,000 residencies, three different occasions. Takes a long time to do that, takes a lot of work. You get extremely educated. Uh, I know that the uh, incumbents are first timers or people running for office. It's terrible, uh, critical that you have good stoop etiquette and you meet the the citizenry going door to door there's nothing like it it's actually it can win elections and it can lose elections well I've learned so much over the time that uh, you know you can you need to learn to profile what neighborhood you're in there's different neighborhoods we, we have different neighborhoods in this community you need to profile the house that you go to you can just look at their yard you can see you can almost tell who, who and how and what uh, the feelings are going to be at that stoop that door when you knock on it um, when you're a first-time candidate, you're nervous, you've got anxiety, it's incredibly hard. 
you never bother anybody. Never, never bother anybody when you're campaigning door to door that's washing a car, raking the yard, or uh, a couple other things. You just don't want to bother them. You know what? You hand off your information and just keep on going. At this point in time, Howard, in my life, at my age, and uh, the experience that I've had in the community and the recognition that's been afforded me, if I went to someone's door now and uh, campaigned, I would certainly say this right off the bat. I'm sorry to bother you, but could I have a moment of your time? I would let them make a decision of whether or not they wanted to talk to me. It would be their call. That's what I've learned walking Mason City three times now. It would be up to them whether or not. There would be a sense of recognition, I'm sure, that they know this guy or they might know my name. And uh, I would leave it up to them. And if they don't want to, you just simply say thank you and walk away. Um, if not, I introduce myself as Max Weaver, and I'm running to be a, a, for the candidacy of mayor of Mason City. And uh, that's what I would do. But that is a trick question. And you know what? The other candidates that sit in this chair, especially the first timers, bless their heart. You know, if you look back in the history of Mason City over the last 50 years, really, how many people have ran for office? Really, out of the 27 to 30,000 people, our population over that 50 years, how it fluctuates, really how many people have stepped forward to do this? It's a pretty special little group, and it's tough. And Howard, that's, that's not a kicker question, that's a very good question. That stoop etiquette is extremely important. Today, I want to say one thing to you, Howard. This is a little commentary. You know, I had that conversation with my family a month ago about walking door to door this time. My kids were little when they did it. They were four, two and four. My kids were on the campaign trail and my wife. We worked hard. And we had doors slammed in our face. I ran against Dolores Q, Ken Q's wife. Very respectable, very responsible, very, very qualified challenger was never our intentions to run or be involved in government. But you know, this, it was probably a month ago, we were sitting there talking and I said, well, do we want to fire up the weaver machine and get out there? And my kids are pretty used to it. And you know what we came up with? We really fell into this. We said, I don't think we can walk today. I don't think we can walk Mason City today. I said, I probably could, but I don't think I want my wife and my kids to. Mason City's changed that much. The dogs alone. There was not, in 1995, when I walked Mason City the first time, there was nowhere near the pit bulls, the log chains coming out. I mean, the mailman will tell you that. I didn't have to carry halt or mace <coughs> to campaign. It has changed. Uh, and we decided that if there's any walking going to be done, it's going to be me. And there's a chance we might have to be pick and choose what doors we knock on. It's just a, I'm, I'm not apologizing for this. I'm just saying that I recognize that the face of Mesa City has changed since 1995. And you've got to be careful out there now. Now, I could get into all kinds of stuff of responsibility. Uh, and it goes right back to what I've told you, and I'm sincere about it. I'm the one candidate that can bring the neighborhoods and the tribes that live in them together. I walk among them. My, my, uh, my public uh, forums that I'm having, my town hall, town hall meetings, have got a huge, diverse group of people attending. And uh, by the way, that is my platform, is... Jobs, of course, you know, need to be at the top of any communities for survival and the tax base that we all live on. But I'm also very, very big in popular uh, public uh, safety. We need to have a full, you, need, you have a right to be safe in your homes, your yards, your church, your events, wherever you go. You need a right. You, you deserve that right. We need a fully staffed police department, fire department, public safety nets, critical. I've always supported that. That also goes on to say that we need clean water, clean air. You have a right to clean air and clean water and infrastructure. The third thing, equality. 
no more than now, this last two years has proven to me and many people, that division I've talked about, everybody needs to be treated equally. Not the 10 percenters, not the 15 percenters, but everyone needs to be enveloped and brought in and use the same door at City Hall uh, and, and be able to equally access the over a million dollars worth of professional staff that we have in City Hall waiting to help you. Now, probably the most aggressive thing that I want to say here is that I would work hard to stop the deals that are struck on a cocktail napkin at the bars, wherever, uh, that come forward. Now, I don't care where those deals are decided, where they're mentioned or worked with or concepts. But when they come to City Hall, they all come through the front door. All our entrepreneurs, as you know, the city lives on entrepreneurial spirit, needs to at least use the same door as somebody else who might have a, a better access. And I support that equality. Uh, everybody should have a right to access the same s staff and have a chance at making a better life for themselves, growing Mason City, their business, and. Uh, and part of my suggestion there is, is you know, as you know, I brought up in my last term that we needed a policy for businesses and how we're going to go into the retail uh, end of economic development. We didn't for years, you know, we didn't uh, help retail. And now that we're doing that, um, they're running without a policy, and that's not fair. Case by case doesn't cut it. I'll tell you this. Look at Harley-Davidson. It's beautiful. It's a great addition to downtown, especially south of the mall, south of downtown. It's really, I, I supported that. It was, a, it, was a, it was a good decision. But I also want to tell you, and I'm going to be very honest with you, a week later, 10 days later, my first phone call, Oceanman owner, from another motorcycle shop. Now, he doesn't live in the area, but he has a franchise here in Mason City. And I knew then, I knew then that I understood where he was coming from, the, uh, the unfair playing field. He explained many things to me. And when you talk tax abatements and you talk giveaways and you talk uh, roads and streets and infrastructure put in and uh, those development agreements, it's, it's fine but you need a policy. I knew then that there was another side to that story. So I think it's inexperience again. Thank you very much.